Dank, ähm, Mikrokulturprozent, dass wir da dürfen, ähm, da sitzen und ein total interessantes Gespräch haben, ganz bestimmt mit der Viva Albertin. Und zwar der Anlass ist, dass ihr ihr Buch Close Music Boys vor zwei Jahren in England rausgekommen, Ende Mai auch in, äh, auf Deutsch rauskommt. Und übrigens, sie wird nach, nach, nach unserem Gespräch draussen noch äh, ein paar englische Exemplare signieren. Ähm, was wir vorher gerade gesehen haben in den Videos... I will start speaking English in a second. <lacht> was wir vorher gesehen haben in den Videos... Das erste war ein, äh, ein, ein recht neues Stück von der Viva Albertin, weil sie vor vier Jahren hat sie ihre Musikkarriere wieder äh, auf, äh, neu angefangen mit dem Album The Vermilion Border. Das Stück Confessions of a Milf ist da drauf. Und nachher haben wir gesehen, äh, ihre erste Band, The Slits, äh, mit Typical Girls. Ein äh, ganz grosses Punkstück aus der, der grossen Zeit von Punk. Um, just a few words about uh, Viv Albertin before we get to the questions. Um, She was born in Sydney, Australia, came to London in 1958. Um, a few years later, she and her mum and her sister went on holidays, and when they came back, uh, the dad was no longer in the house. Um, she went to a very militant art school, Hornsey, and later on Hammersmith and Chelsea, where she got to know Mick Jones, the later guitar player in, in The Clash. She um, formed the Flowers of Romance, with Sid, uh, Sid Vicious in 1976. Um, the Slits followed shortly after when uh, The Flowers of Romance ended in very unpleasant circumstances. The, the Slits were basically the only all-female punk band. I think that's right, isn't it? I don't know, we didn't use the label punk, so... Oh, well, okay, well, fair enough. Know. Even in retrospect, was there any other all-female band? Well, uh, Raincoats. Okay, yeah. Um, but they were later, weren't they? Not, not really, same no? time as us. Yeah. Okay. Um, Labels. Hmm. Yeah, well. <laughs> um, the Slits ended, what, 1982? There followed um, an, uh, a period of realigning yourself, trying to find other things, because music, I believe, was a bit... You felt it was very depressing, the way that the slits had ended. Are we starting now, or are you still doing your...? I'm just... No, I don't, li slowly, I don't like this. Slowly. I don't like this. No? No. Okay, I'll just <laughs> give the, the rest of the biographical details, and then we... Yeah, that'll come out in the talk, won't it? <laughs> okay, well... You said it was going to be the same as our chat last week, which you didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, but I have to do a short introduction. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> make it short then. Punk, make it punk. All right, well, you, uh, you were married. You write this about, about this in your book. You, you had a, a child. You um, got involved in ceramics, etc. and so forth. Uh, in 2008, you bought a new guitar. Why? Now we start. But we're starting. Okay, good. <laughs> so I don't know how you could make my life sound so boring, frankly. <laughs> Ceramics and marriage. And well, that's the facts, isn't it? Well, it's some facts. You could say, you know, you gave a blowjob to Johnny Rotten and it went wrong. And you took heroin with, uh, uh, with uh, what's his name? Johnny, Johnny Thunders or you... Started, you know, there's different versions. You got cancer. It's a bit more exciting, isn't it? Anyway, so what, why did I pick up a guitar as an old lady? Um, <clears throat> I don't know because I was driven like I was a teenager again. I I'd spent many years ill, many years being married. I I was in quite an emotionally abusive marriage without knowing it, which is I think quite common, and um, I'd lost myself through illness and an abusive marriage, emotionally abusive marriage, and motherhood, 
Um, so, you know, all these things have good and positive sides. Well, motherhood obviously has a positive side, but it has a negative side. You do lose yourself in another person. And I was completely lost. I was like um, an amoeba, a little piece of plankton. And um, I started to heal unknown to myself. I, I uh, moved to the, out of London. I think that was a big step because... Of course, one, one question, why did you pick up guitar, doesn't have one sexy answer when you really think about it. Lots of threads come to you making a big change in your life. And um, so I moved to, the, moved to the sea. I started to relax, not thinking about people breaking in, not thinking what I look like. I, I started going to art school once a week, just as a middle-aged woman might, wanting to make brown pots. Um, and bit by bit, all these things started to heal me, and as you get healthier, your brain begins to fire up again, and my brain started to fire up creatively after 20 years of being dead creatively. And I never thought that creative person would ever arrive again. Goodbye, dead. And to my surprise, I started to have uh, creative thoughts um, about making things, about what I thought about, you know, I'd lost even my ideas about who I was. I started thinking about architecture. I started thinking about color. I started very simply, like a plankton. I started to think, what color do I like? And why do I like that color? Um, and I started to think, what music do I like? Why do I like that music? I had to rebuild my personality like an amnesia victim. And all that led back to the guitar, which was so strange because I never thought about the guitar for 25 years, but suddenly I had to have a guitar. I thought, the, you know, not consciously, but the only way I could express myself again was through music suddenly. Um, and so I sat in my bedroom or at the kitchen table like a 17-year-old boy, my tongue out, trying to play chords again. And uh, one day... I couldn't get my fucking fingers around the chords. I never could, I still can't. And so I started smashing at the guitar. It was plugged into a little lamp. My daughter, you know, was probably doing her homework in another corner. And she looked up and said, Mummy, you were born to play guitar. Because the noise I made on that guitar when I was angry was the same sort of noise I made in the slits on the guitar. Sort of lots of open strings, a bit, maybe a bit modal, um, no chord structures. I just made a sort of riff out of the anger. And uh, that is when my daughter looked up, not all through the months and months of me trying to play chords, but that's when she looked up and said, wow, you know, this woman who she'd only seen as an extension of herself, as her slave, um, suddenly became separate, a separate being, you know. And so... The, Lots of threads led to me picking up a guitar, but that was probably the moment when she was the only person in the world, she was seven, who gave me any encouragement. And I treated her encouragement as if it had come from God, or at least the head of the BBC, <laughs> because that's all I had. And sometimes that's all you have in life, you know, when people are telling you you're shit, and what you do is shit, and your, your work is shit. Um, and your personality shit and your body shit. Sometimes it is only something you hear on the radio or something a seven-year-old kid says. Sometimes there's no one you have to get the strength from. And, and I took it from that. My kid, who was seven, I thought, she knows. Um, and it lasted me three or four years, that one sentence. Mm. <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting parallel, though, because picking it up again... Uh, it was something that you did very much against the grain, as you just said, and as it's in the book, your daughter was your only fan for quite a while. Um, and you got quite a lot of abuse, both from your husband and the people that you played to in various pubs. Uh, but, I mean, that's not so very different to when you first picked up a guitar in 1976 uh, without being able to actually play the guitar. And you describe yourself as a shy person in the book. Where did you get the courage from in 1976 to pick up a guitar and do something, even though, in conventional terms, you knew that you, 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 you had no idea how to treat the guitar mm. or write songs? Mm. And no role models. 
no female role models, um, because obviously no internet. I had no idea if any other girl anywhere was playing guitar, um, because they certainly, I didn't know of any in, in London. Um, where did I get that courage from? I, I didn't think about it till recently, because People ask me when they read the book, you know, what made you that person who, a working class girl, single parent family, very poor education, um, no confidence in a very patriarchal 1970s, small minded Britain, um, you know, and unable to play a musical instrument. What made me one of the 10 girls in the country pick up an electric guitar, maybe even less than 10, maybe five? And uh, all, all I can think now as I've thought and thought and thought about it, because people would love to say, oh, it's when you met, met Sid Vicious or when you met Mick Jones, you know. It wasn't. It was my mother and possibly even my grandmother because the, uh, what's the word, the inheritance they've left me is to be an incredibly um, questioning and strong and um, sort of iconoclastic and brave woman. And that was drilled into me from very young. And it, in some ways it's very bad because my mother drilled into me, never rely on a man, always make your own money, you know, probably quite a hatred of men actually, and a, definitely a deep distrust, a mistrust of men. Um, I, I've been brainwashed against men. Um, in the presence of my father and my father, um, who didn't do much to make me think otherwise. Um, so although my mother took that away from me, she took away from me any thought of relationships and love and companionship and children and family, she did instead instill in me a sort of slightly jihadi fighter spirit that made me go against um, patriarchy um, see every failure as opportunity um, to never be ashamed of my crazy ideas and to think way above the level of what was expected of me, any, any young poor girl in England in the 70s, but to think way above my station in life, as they say in Britain. Um, that's made me the sort of person when I saw for one moment a little crack open up in the music scene and a chance for me who couldn't play, couldn't sing, never played an instrument, uh, no education, no contacts, I saw a crack of light that I could shoot through that crack before it closed and it did close within about 18 months and uh, take an opportunity. And I am an opportunist and I saw it again when the internet happened. You know, in between, I didn't see any chance for me to uh, express myself without being, without having to always ask permission from white men to let me in the gates, please. You know, white men who run record labels, indie labels, major labels, white men who played records on the radio, white men who ran Rec recording companies, um, studios, played instruments. I, I didn't feel the confidence to be able to make a noise until the internet happened. The se that was the second time I saw the opportunity. I don't need you fuckers. <laughs> and I was 50 then. I know it's militant, it's not very nice, it's not very sexy, but it's how I was brought up, and it gave, it made me, it's made me maybe not the most charming of women, but it has made me a fighter. And for one, you know, since writing the book, I don't apologize for that anymore. Um, there's plenty of charming women who wear dresses and cook. There's less of us fighters. Uh, I, I think it may be, you could also mention your grandma, because, I mean, that's yes. an extraordinary story. Yeah. 16-year-old. Yeah, my grandmother was Swiss. And uh, my grandmother left uh, Switzerland in about 19, early 1900s, you know, what we call Edwardian times, you know, long dresses. She was 16 years old. She came from a, par a, par a farm um, in Switzerland, very poor country then. She was, she was nothing. A 16-year-old girl in poor 1900s Switzerland, her and a friend decided they'd leave Switzerland and come to London with five francs in their pocket. 
The night before, her friend dropped out. She came on her own, 16 years old, knew nobody, to London, and ended up making a whole life for herself here. You know, had a family of five children. She worked, she married, she owned a house when she died. And when she died, my grandmother left me 200 pounds, which, you know, maybe that's about 1,000 nowadays, 1,000 pounds. The most money I'd ever seen in my life and the most money I would ever see. And I decided with that money, I was going to buy an electric guitar. So my grandmother set me up for life with that guitar. Not because I could play it, not because I was a musician, but the, the bold move she made coming to London had an effect on me, and I made a bold move with the money she left me. So, you know, that's, that's a lineage, that's an inheritance back to Switzerland, back to my Swiss grandmother, who, you know, it, it took me years to recognize that journey, that thread, that bold thing she did on her own, and the hard work and the years it took her to be an old lady in England with a house who, when it was sold, left her granddaughter, one of her grandchildren, 200 pounds, who then made another crazy bold move, bought an electric guitar, when no girls played guitar, when she couldn't even play guitar herself. You know, no girls played electric guitar in bands. So, yeah, this... Thank you, Switzerland, for making my grandmother. <laughs> so, 1976, you buy this guitar. Um, you write that punk is all about honesty and not accepting anything fake and any attitudes and all that kind of thing. How did uh, the, the, the joy that you took uh, and whatever you want to call them, that generation of kids and that geographical bunch of kids that you were part of, uh, where did the pleasure in, in shock come from? What was the function of shock? Um, well, it was a very simple society back then. I, I don't think shock works anymore. But, you know, I, I went to art school. I, I studied shock. I studied Dada. I studied surrealism. You know, I was very influenced by that, And as, as was the 60s. I was very influenced by the 60s and shock shock magazines like Oz or, you know. So shock was very much part of my culture, um, my cultural education. So it was fairly uh, easy step, you know, to move another step forwards and, and, and use shock. I mean, shock is a kind of a, a bit of a lazy way to communicate, but it sure does work, you know. When you shock people, for a minute there, you've got their attention without all their habitual thoughts um, clouding what they see. You know, we shocked, the slits shocked visually with how we looked. We shocked with our music. We shocked with our attitude. Um, the, the boys shocked in different ways, maybe... Um, actually, not so much, because they're really quite old school. <laughs> you know, people like The Clash and, and, and The Pistols, much as they are, you know, up writ large um, in the history of punk, they're really just rock bands, you know. The Slits weren't a rock band. The Slits had no history of wanting to be in a band. We, we were absolutely fresh to the um, idea of being musicians. We didn't bring with us all the habits and the cliches of rock, uh, which made us much more radical than you know, almost all the other bands, certainly all the male bands. Um, I've forgotten the question, Hans-Peter. What was it again? The value of shock. Oh, the value of shock, yeah. So, yeah, it does. It clears the mind. I always think it's like a sorbet halfway through the meal, clearing the palate, <laughs> you know. It, it absolutely, for a second there, depending how big the shock is, you have an empty mind looking back at you um, and a reaction. I mean, you know, it's even harder to get a reaction now, but, it, you know, we needed shock then to, to, to get a reaction to say, look, think again. Think again about your sexuality. Think again about the music you're listening to. Think about the lyrics. And shock was a way to clear the decks, really. Get good. Yeah. But, but, but you also seem to like really um, enjoy shocking each other. I mean, the way you describe Sid Vicious's behaviour is just filthy. Ari Up is fairly filthy. Mm. How could you actually tolerate kind of being treated... Well, Sid Vicious tied you to, um, what do you call them? Um, the, the, um, handcuffs. Handcuffs for a day. And, uh, I mean, things like that. I mean, how could you tolerate all that? Um, it... 
we, we were living in a time which we were making our own fun. I mean, we, we had no money. We didn't know how to entertain ourselves. We couldn't even get into a club. We, we were so very poor. I mean, we were very poor for a long time. So we made our own entertainment. And part of that was, tr you know, thinking up stupid things to do, like, oh, we'll handcuff each other and go around for a whole day handcuffed together, you know, which I forgot would mean I'd have to piss in front of Sid and things like that. But, um, and... It, we were bored. We were just so bored. So we, I suppose we took delight, rather like children, in um, shocking the grown-ups, the adults. We, we, it wasn't anything profound, really. We were just terribly bored and terribly poor. And I think young people now are not so bored, obviously, because they've got so much entertainment and they're taken more seriously. And they're not so poor in general and they're not so silenced. So they're not so shocking. But we had nothing to lose. You know, it, it was a delight. It was like we were, we were so oppressed that to shock our oppressors was exciting, you know. Mm. What role did um, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood play there? And what would you say is their, their legacy today? Yeah, I mean, they, you know, if you see, it's ter there was no hierarchy, supposedly, in punk. But Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren and their shop was the hub of what, you know, that 18 months now called punk rock. Um, and the interesting thing is, because they were a bit older, um, we possibly respected them a bit more. They, they were both really well-educated, um, very, very culturally aware. And Malcolm McLaren had been to art school. He was well-traveled, which was unusual in the 70s because no one had the money to fly anywhere. It wasn't an international culture. Um, he was well traveled he'd been you know spent a lot of time in paris and new york and he um was very educated on situationism and again you know all the art movements <clears throat> political movements from france um and vivian westwood was a very unusual woman because i had never met a woman before certainly not a working class woman who was strong and powerful and had no intention of pleasing men in any way. She almost never smiled. I mean, that was unheard of in the 70s. Women smiled till their faces ached. Um, women still smile too much, I think, but um, Vivian Westwood didn't smile. And when she said something, men shook with fear. <laughs> and that was so unusual then. She did not give a fuck about being sexually attractive or being liked. She, to meet a woman who didn't care about being liked was unbelievable. And then on top of that, I, I watched her make her clothes. And she would just get a T-shirt, shitty T-shirt from India or somewhere. And well, it mattered very much what the collar and what the sleeves were like. Every little detail mattered in those days. The cheap T-shirts she got from India didn't look good, didn't look right. So she just hacked them off with a pair of scissors. Too lazy to sew them, so she left them fraying. Okay, they still look bad. Turn them inside out. Let's make them look worse. A lot of punk was about making things even worse because you couldn't make them better. And... Um, so she turned it inside out, and everything that you see is normal today, deconstructed clothing, seams on the outside, labels on the outside, slogans, all comes from Vivian Westwood. Totally untrained in fashion, but loads of attitude. And that gave me um, the courage, I think, to apply her attitude towards songwriting. Suddenly it didn't matter that I've never written a song, that I've never played an instrument. I could take her method and apply it to songwriting, and I've applied it to writing. I've applied it to everything I've done creatively since, probably, yeah. Uh, another important person in your life, in fact, since age like 14, 15, may be surprising because she was derided and hated by the media in general for decades until more recently, Yoko Ono. Yeah, so saying I had no female role models when I was young. I mean, I had my mother, my God, please don't let me end up my, like my mother. I had a few teachers, horrible. Um, nothing, you know, my sister, younger than me. I had no role models. You know, I, I knew no artists. I, I saw no one in the media I wanted to be. I mean, I wasn't even conscious I had no role models. I was just, you know, moving around a world where there was no one I wanted to be. I adored John Lennon. He was intelligent, he spoke about women a lot, he spoke about the importance of women in his life, he was very open about his motion, emotions, he was a very, very unusual young man. Um, and then he 
hooked up with Yoko Ono, and I couldn't believe it, you know, that she so obviously was his equal. He spoke often about how much she affected his work and influenced his work, how he respected her work. And, of course, she was derided in the um, British press, uh, but girls my age, 14, 15, we... And no 14, 15-year-old is so stupid, I think, as to take on... Um, and believe what they're told, but we certainly didn't believe what we told, and we, we adored Yoko Ono. I mean, um, someone's mother had the book, Grapefruit, that she wrote, which we passed around. You know, the very fact that she would use one word as a poem or just a, a doodle was art. Um, it was like taking drugs. It was completely mind-expanding how, how Yoko Ono thought, and of course now she is getting the recognition she deserves. And I mean, obviously many female artists well, are dead and dying and buried and they either never got to express themselves or, or never certainly made the um, big impact she made. But l lucky for me, and, you know, her and John Lennon got together and, and I got exposed to such an unusual um, mind as Yoko Ono's, yeah. So having, having somebody like that, and I mean, I know your music's musical tastes before that were, were really eclectic, I mean... We share a liking for the third ear band and the incredible string band. Um, so when you write in your book that uh, punk was supposed to be open-minded and do it yourself, but it was rigid and unforgiving, did you feel you actually had to rebel against punk as well? Um, did I feel... Well, the thing is, as I said, punk, you know, we questioned each other all the time. It was a very, very harsh movement. We had to justify what we wore, how we dressed how we loved, how we had sex, um, how we sang, um, the rhythms, everything was pulled to pieces. Um, and Vivian Westwood was probably the, the, the hardest critic of all. Uh, and, you know, as we all respected, and I very much respected Vivian Westwood, you know, I was terrified of, you know, stepping outside. Um, you know, I thought very hard about every single aspect of my life, probably through Vivian Westwood's eyes, you know, whether you ate meat, uh, she, she was incredibly harsh on all of us, but it made us know what we were talking about and know what we believed in, which has now become rather wishy-washy. Um, so did I rebel against punk? Uh, probably, probably I rebelled against punk when I decided to get married and, you know, drive an Audi and... Uh, <laughs> you know, wear nice clothes. I, I, I was so tired. I was so burnt out by the end of punk. I was so tired with the fighting and the fighting to be heard amongst uh, the establishment and the, and the justifying ourselves between the band. I mean, the band, every rehearsal would be talked about, you know, what clothes were politically acceptable, what clothes were changing people's ideas, what, how to stand with a guitar. You know, do we ape men as if we've got big bollocks with our legs wide apart and the guitar right down here? You know, do we perpetuate that or do we try and stand differently? But when we stood differently, then guys would write in the press, girls don't look good with guitars because they'd never seen a girl with a guitar or in a skirt and a guitar. And what length skirt should we wear with the guitar? <laughs> and can I get away with a ballet dress with a guitar? That would be political, but it might look shit. So whereas the guys were getting better and better at playing, <laughs> we would spend at least two hours of every rehearsal talking about the political dimensions of what we were playing and how we appeared because we were first, and when you're first through the wall, you get bloody, as the Americans say, such a great expression. Um, everyone else tramples over you and makes the money kind of thing, but um, I'm not bitter <laughs> at all. But um, I'm not bitter because I'd rather be, I like being first. Um, yeah, so did I rebel against punk? I probably, I think I was too exhausted. I mean, the whole thing, you had to be on your game all the time with the establishment, with the music business, with your peer group, within the band, and it was just... I, I, I was on my knees with tiredness, you know. P plus, I was incredibly poor and didn't eat properly for the whole seven, eight years, you know. I was ill. Um, so I probably didn't in rebel in a way. It was over anyway. I mean, it's Britain being such a poor, small country like Switzerland, th th there is no room to be hanging around, you know, once you've had your moment in the sun, 
It's like, get off the island, <laughs> because actually we've got to make room for someone else now. Uh, unlike America, who are very loyal to their artists, you know. In, in what way did your illnesses change your perspective of things? Um, you know, I think, you know, throughout history, you can see the um, illnesses do have massive effects on artists, actually. You know, often it's when you start to germinate new ideas. I mean, many, many famous artists, who of course I can't think of now, have spent a lot of time in bed ill. Um, because you, you, it forces you to go inside and think. And that's when you come up with new stuff. You don't come up with new stuff, you know, scrolling through the internet for hours every day or watching great TV or whatever. It's when you're bored you come up with great ideas. And I suppose I had about, in the end, 20 years of illness um, and seclusion which um, has made me come back now with as much energy as I had at 19. And, you know, I'm not tired of music. Well, I'm tired of music. It's just dead, in my opinion. But um, I'm not tired of myself, actually. I'm, I'm interested in my thoughts because I went dead for so long that I feel like a, I don't know myself. I'm creating myself again. So illness, I think... Um, I think we should have enforced illness periods <laughs> on every artist in the world. I think you do your first piece of work, this is my theory, you do your first piece of work, which is always great, you know, it comes from all your hang-ups, all your humiliations, who you've, what's made you, you do your first piece of work, and then they say, right, you've done your first, week of work, first piece of work, 10 years now, you're not allowed to create. And that gives room for the next young person to do their, next, their first piece of work. And when you come back after 10 years of enforced boredom, life, you know, family, whatever, boy, do you want to make something with passion. It's not about, oh, 18 months, I've got to get a new record out, or I'm going to lose my audience. 10 years of pent up, I'm going to show them. I've got something different. I mean, imagine if artists, you know, had to have those 10 years. Well, I enforced it on myself, and I'm enforcing it again. I'm not going to make another record because I don't feel passionately I've got something to contribute to the musical lexicon, lexicon at the moment. So I just wish other musicians felt the same. <laughs> Instead of churning out the same old chord structures, the same old positions, the same old guitar sounds... It's so dull. Anyway, yeah. I found particularly uh, the chapter about the chapters about your uh, marriage. I found really interesting as well because um, here's something that starts with with an amazing passion and kind of a, a manly biker type who smells very nicely, and uh, it's all beautiful. And then all of a sudden it starts turning, and this bloke is changing changing colours, as it were until one, one towards the end, you write, he and I were from ideologi ideologically different times. He was a child of the Thatcher era, so politics got into your private life. Yeah. Um, you know, any relationship deteriorating, you know, within the home, it's very hard to see it happen. It's so small, such incremental, de you know, tiny, tiny little moments and things that happen change your um, reactions to each other, your respect for each other. It happened so slowly, I, di I didn't really see it happen. But it was when, I suppose, because of my illnesses, etc., etc., we became codependents. And I think that is the most destructive of relationships, really. Because as I began to heal, the, uh, <coughs> the carer, him, was without a role. And, and actually, you know, even in sadomasochism, it's really the masochist who, who has the power. And it is, it is the weaker one of a codependent uh, relationship who often has the power, because if they heal, the, the carer doesn't have a role. And he panicked. He could see me becoming whole again, and he wasn't used to that. He didn't know what his role would be. I mean, I've had that said to me from managers and record company guys. They don't want to sign a woman who knows who she is. What will my role be? I've, ha I've had managers say that to me. You know, there's nothing for me to mold here. Um, they want the kudos of that. They want the power of molding the artist. And then they go to a convention like this and everyone says, oh, well done, you discovered blah. You know, they don't get that if Viv Albertine already exists whole. And my husband started to panic that he didn't have a role. Um, I suggested in many different ways that we could actually 
you know, be parallel going along and in, he could enjoy my new musical life. He loved music, uh, but his ego found it too threatening. Um, and I, I didn't actually blame him for it. I could see why that would be threatening. If he joined a band of 45, I would have been threatened. Um, but anyway, it got cruel. I think that's when I really got out because I thought threatened is one thing, but to be cruel um, and abusive emotionally, that is not acceptable because I had a daughter. It was easier and harder in some ways, but easier to walk away for my daughter. She must not see her mother being spoken to like that. She must not see her mother being squashed like that. And, and I've heard and read that women find it much easier to um, stand up for themselves when it involves um, standing up for another person, strangely. you know. So I don't think if I'd had my daughter, I may never have left. Um, but I couldn't let her see this and that be her role model, her first, um, her first experience of what a relationship is. So... I have one more question in this context, and maybe we can have some questions from the floor. And the question is, uh, there's a very odd chapter in, in the book also about Vincent Gallo, mm. who contacts you out of the blue and s says he has, he has ideas. Mm. I mean, firstly, did he ever explain what the ideas were? And secondly, that seemed to be a kind of galvanizing effect on you. Yes, it would be nice if it was Vincent Gallo who made me the person I am. But like I said, um, he's one of many threads, um, partly going back to my Swiss grandmother, my mother, um, my guitar playing, Yoko Ono, my art school education, um, my mistrust of men, um, my spirit, uh, um, back to art school again living by the seaside, and one tiny thread is Vincent Gallo. Um, so let's get him in perspective here. You know, I'm not going to have lived this life and have it put down to fucking men <laughs> that I'm here. Um, so, yeah, Vincent Gallo, I got a letter from L.A., Sunset Boulevard, saying, um, I need to speak to you about something. It's very important. I didn't know who Vincent Gallo was. I was in a cocoon. Um, but my husband said, oh, Vincent Gallo is fantastic. You've got to write back to him. No, no, I said, it's just another guy writing, you know, fan or whatever. But anyway, eventually, what Vincent Gallo did for me, um, apart from a bit of harm, he's a mind fucker, but um, what the good he did, I mean, thank God he was thousands of miles away, but um, what he did do from across the Atlantic Ocean was um, remind me who I used to be, because he was very, very um, a big fan of the slits when he was 18. And he had modeled himself on the slits. And there he was reflecting the slits and who I used to be back to me like 25 years later, you know, reminding me who the fuck I used to be. And, you know, I'd influenced people who I now admired, you know, um, bands and Vincent Gallo or whatever. And also, America being sort of slightly ahead in some ways of Britain, women of a certain age uh, were not considered invisible <coughs> in America as they were still in 2007 in Britain. And so to have this guy who was a musician and a filmmaker and a writer and whatever, um, be having been influenced by me, telling me that actually, Viv, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are, why aren't you doing stuff still? He put the idea in my head, along with my art teacher and my ceramics and, uh, you know, the guy who owned the, the um, record shop and uh, the stuff I was reading again, put the idea back in my head that actually life wasn't over for me. Um, and it was great that it came from someone who I thought was doing interesting things. I couldn't have listened. To, I, could, I wouldn't have believed it if my mum said it. My mum probably did say it. You know, Viv, it doesn't matter that you're 45. You can still make art. I was, yeah, mum, you're just saying that because you're my mum. But Vincent Gallo, who was still functioning in the world and, you know, making a load of money and films, et cetera, et cetera, that, that was coming from a peer, you know, so that was great, yeah. Right. Oh, did, oh, by the way, yeah, his idea, which was such a funny one, was um, he's going to bring out a line of handbags <laughs> and he wants to name one the Viv Albertine, <laughs> which was complete, just a chat-up line. 
<laughs> it never existed, this whole idea, this whole company, the whole thing was a chat-up line. And he thought, what will attract a woman of 45? You know, what will get her interested in me? Hmm. You know, I'll name like a Kelly bag or a Bardo <laughs> or whatever. You know, I'll name a bag after her. Oh, dear. I knew it was bullshit, but I knew there was something else I could use. And I, because of how I've been brought up, I use that excuse. I am a user of men. You know, not sexually, but they had what I wanted from when I was very young. They had what I wanted. And I wanted to learn how the fuck did I get what they've got? How do I get to be someone who is in a band? How do I get to be someone that other people want to be? How do I get to hitchhike around the world without being attacked? You know, I want to live that life. I, I didn't have role models of women whose life I wanted to live. I do now, but I didn't then. Right. Uh, are there any questions? I'm sure there's loads of questions that are somewhere in the back of minds. Go on. I've been honest now. You can ask me a question. <coughs> I was going to say, if no one asks me a question, I'm going to pick on someone randomly and ask them about their sex life. <laughs> oh, I should have warned you. <laughs> <laughs> so you better put your hand up quickly or I'm going to randomly ask someone about their sex life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You mentioned that the slits um, finished in quite unfortunate circumstances. Would you mind telling us a little bit how that happened? Why did you guys break up? Um, I don't think I said that. I think you said the uh, flowers of romance That's what I said. Um, yeah. split up in unfortunate circumstances. But how the slit split up was, it was a bit like a relationship just sort of running its course, really. I mean, we'd been together seven years. We, we lived together. We were together every night, staying at each other's houses because the way we dressed um, meant we were um, under attack on the streets. We were attacked often, stabbed, spat at, you know, verbally and physically abused. So we had to go everywhere, the four of us together, and later the three of us. So, um, you know, for our safety. So we'd actually had enough of each other. And then... Sa Margaret Thatcher, the Conservative Prime Minister, got in, and the whole of England started to shift towards being a consumerist capitalist, much more consumerist ca capitalist society. And there was no room for scruffy girls trying to change things for feminism. It, it all went under the, under the sort of surge for wanting money and, you know, pedicures and label clothes. I mean, the whole landscape of Britain changed. The whole sort of um, a spiritual and moral landscape of Britain changed. It was shocking. Shocking to me. It always been an alternative. So within that sort of environment, there was no room. For, no one wanted to play the slits. No one wanted to book us. No one wanted to write about us. We were sick of each other. Um, musically, we were going in different directions, which is perfectly normal, you know. And punk is not sentimental, there's no way we're going to hang out and be together forever for the band, you know, like people, you know, like people like the Rolling Stones or whatever, you know, there was no way we were going to be some old band that stuck together for the sake of the gang, you know. Um, I don't think women have that pack mentality so much anyway. Um, so it was just kind of a natural falling apart um, to do with the times and our sort of being fed up. It, it was just like the end. Well, I always say it was like the end of three marriages at once. I, I lost my surname. I mean, I was known as Viv Slit, and Tessa was Tessa Slit, and Ari was Ari Slit. So it was like a massive divorce, and it took me years to rebuild my personality, and I, I've had to do that quite a few times through my life. I, I've, I've lost completely who I was, either through illness, the band splitting up, divorce, you know, and had to rebuild from scratch. It's painful, and you're usually poor when you're doing it, um, and you're outside society, but it is rejuvenating when you get there if you don't give up. And people do give up and commit suicide and whatever. You know, people do give up. But I hoped in my book I showed a way that you can keep being reborn, and you just have to take those periods where, uh, you know, you're lonely and you're poor and no one gives a shit about you and you don't know who you are yourself and, um, you know, not give up in those times. Uh, and I do that many times in my life, many, many, in little ways and in some ways, big ways. And sometimes I have a decade of loneliness. And I, I was saying to someone earlier that, you know, I went to a 
terrible school. I lived in a terrible neighborhood. Um, I knew lots of very poor people. Uh, we had no prospects in life. And yet when I was at school, not one person committed suicide. Now I've now got a 16-year-old daughter. And we know lots of young women and men who have and you know, or know of a lot of young women and men who have committed suicide uh, because of the pressures on young people now to be successful. Um, and they think they've, if not, they haven't been successful by the time they're 27, they're failures. And I really wanted somehow, if they could get hold of this book, if it somehow reached them, for them to realize, because they think I'm cool, you know, um, to realize actually you can be cool and you could have had 10 years of being a lonely loser. And that you have to factor that into your life you know, it may take ten, you may have a 10 year shit period, never mind 10 weeks or 10 months or 10 days. Um, you know, I've had 10 years of that a couple of times. And you still come back, you know, but you've got to hang on in there. And I don't think there are many role models saying that now. You know, it's all about grabbing it now and taking the money now and being famous now and what you're doing now. And if you've got a start up or a pop up, are you gaming? Are you this? Are you that? But actually, how about answering, no, I'm in a 10 year slump. <laughs> and I'm fucking bored and I'm poor. And the more people who say that, the more it's like, yeah, cool. We, we were like that all the time. I mean, that was the British way. I mean, when I was young, it was like... And young guys and females say to me, oh, why did you go to art school? Um, what did you want to do when you left? I know you joined a band with Sid Vicious, but what did you intend to do when you left? And we had no fucking intentions in the 70s. It was like, can I not work for another three years? That was, that was the level of sort of aspiration we had. Can I live somewhere where I don't have to pay? Can I get through the next day on just a bowl of breakfast cereal? Um, and in a way, not to be thought of, well, no one cared. We were thought of as losers. I mean, if I'd met a judge or a dentist or whatever, they would have thought me a loser. But I didn't even meet those people, so I didn't know. There was no one judging me online. There was no one talking about the youth of today on television. For all the fact that we were neglected, we were free to play and we were free to make mistakes and make trouble. And that is why the government now wants every young person to feel like a failure if they don't own a home by the time they're 27. Because if you own a home, you're in a DIY shop every weekend and you're not making trouble on the streets. You are working hard to keep capitalism going. And I think it's a complete con. And, you know, I, I, I reckon everyone should have built into their psyche 10 years where you fuck about. And that's completely normal. I mean, you know, my sister lives in America and on the West Coast there, they, they work towards having four days of no work a week and three days of work. And it doesn't matter what work you do. This is kind of like Northern California or Oregon. You know, you're not judged by the work you do. No one comes up to you in Northern Oregon and says, what do you do? No one cares. It's, it's do you earn enough money to have four days a week to go camping, go hiking, you know, do your own thing, paint pictures. And I think maybe that's more what we should be aiming for, you know, rather than all, um, you know, aiming to own a house and whatever. Yeah, four days off, three days on or something like that. <laughs> well, you mentioned time, etc. It's slowly running out, but maybe would, you'd like to read us a chapter from the book to, oh, to okay. end this yeah. um, wonderful hour. So, I mean, I, I wrote very much with young women in mind when I wrote my book, but I didn't want to do it in a way like I'm a teacher. So I wanted to teach them things about sex or maybe their bodies in a way that they wouldn't know they were learning a lesson. So I hope you realize that this, this chapter is not about giving a blowjob, really. It has a subtext. Um, so it's 1976, and Iggy Pop's album, The Idiot, is playing on the stereo. I'm lying on a mattress in my loft with Johnny Rotten. We've ended up in bed together a couple of times, but usually we're with loads of other people because we've all missed the bu last bus home. Johnny and I have both got all our clothes on and we lie there gossiping about a couple of people, Sid Vicious mostly and how he's fucking up. But um, when we run out of conversation, uh, Johnny asked me to go down on him, which give him a blowjob. I'm, I'm talking very much in the language of the 70s here. So Johnny says, oh, give me a blowjob, Viv. Go down on me. Well, I've never given anyone a blowjob before. Really, I haven't. 
I suppose I should have done by now. I am 22. And I have sort of snuffled down around that area lots of times. But I haven't actually tried to make a guy come by sucking him off. So my lesson there is, girls, I was fucking 22. I was at art school. I'd had sex. But I'd never given anyone a blowjob. You know, you don't have to do what is asked of you all the time. You don't have to do what is expected of you in the media all the time. Anyway, I think to myself, oh, I'll give it a go. I've just got to lick it and suck it. How difficult can it be? So I slide down to Johnny's crotch, and he gets his willy out, cock, penis. He smells of stale piss. So do I. We all do. I like it. I like that smell. It's familiar. That smell is nice and cozy to me. No one I know washes before or after sex. It doesn't occur to us. And we're, we're not squeamish about bodily smells. We expect it to smell different down there and to be all dark and hairy and maybe even a bit crispy if you haven't been home for a few days. Because nowadays, you know, it's like rip all the hair off every part of you. I'm saying you might as well stick a penis in someone's armpit. Who, you know, it's, it's not different enough. Uh, we knew we were doing something a bit different because it really smelt different down there. Anyway, so I tentatively start sucking. But after a few licks, I hear this voice from up high on high, like, um, I don't know if you know these people, like Quentin Crisp mixed with the Artful Dodger, like a Dickensian voice. Stop it, Viv. I look up. What's he want? I'm busy down here. Stop it, Viv, he says. You're trying too hard. <laughs> I laugh, but I'm mortified. I wipe my mouth on the back of my hand. He zips up his trousers and we go downstairs. <clears throat> I make a quick cup of tea, and then he leaves, thank God. And I cringe inside, imagining him laughing at me as he walks to the train station. In fact, I'm still cringing now, 25 years later. <laughs> Viv Albertine, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to sign a few books outside. Oh.